Cool. All right, I guess I can get started. Yep. All right. Thanks, All right, Bob. Okay, guys, um, what I thought I would do this week was try to debunk a few myths and, and hopefully simplify the weight training world. So um, while I was doing my original degree, I also became a certified strength and conditioning specialist. And that's 25 years ago. And 25 years ago, they didn't have that in Canada. So I had to go to the States and it was a written exam. You had to have a degree. Um, it was a written exam and a practical exam. And that gave me the license to work anywhere in the world as a strength coach. I don't do it very often. It's not my passion. Um, but I do do, I do use a lot of the exercise physiology components and the exercise science components to change and modify um, people's expectations and like the scenario we're doing tonight with you and educate. Um, strength, can, strength training can be incredibly confusing. And because, you know, it's not so much, let's say, I don't wanna say safe, cause safe is a bad word right now, but let's say it's not necessarily conducive to everybody being in the gym with a personal trainer and just showing up and not having to worry about what they're going to do with you and what the expectation is. Nowadays, everyone's going to take on a role as their own personal trainer and their own strength and conditioning coach. So I was hoping to give you a little bit of information and guidance into that. So um, there's a lot of buzzwords. And the one thing with fitness and, and, and in certain worlds and nutrition is everything follows fads. And in any given year and every any given moment, there's going to be a fad. And fitness is, is definitely at the forefront to fads. And a lot of it will come from, let's say, Connor McDavid, you know, just before COVID. A lot of what he did to um, recover from his PCL injury would now be considered a bit of a fad in the exercise world. But that's because a lot of the information that he did on top of that is missing. Another fad, um, Summer Olympics, two, two Summer Olympics ago, the women's uh, beach volleyball team all ended up with kinesio tape. And they were paid to do that. And all of a sudden, everybody is, can I get that tape? Can I get tape? Can I get tape? One Summer Olympics ago, Michael Phelps got cut. And he had these little pepperonis uh, bruises all over his back before he went into the water and everybody wanted cupping. So strength conditioning is no different. It becomes fad and it's a fad to foam roll. It's a fad to maybe do Pilates. It's kind of whatever the buzz term is. Well, I want to remove those because I hate fads. Science is evidence-based. Science is tried and true. And science has been around longer than Kyle and I have been. So I want to give you guys, I want to take away some of the confusion and what complicates strength conditioning and give you the details that bring you back to the basics. So human evolution has given us five movements. Five. That's it, guys. Five. We push, which is chest and triceps. We pull, which is back and biceps. Okay. So push and pull days, we do a hinge at the hip movement, which is anything that would give you, let's say an abduction or an extension of the hip. We squat, okay, everybody knows what a squat is. And the fifth movement that our body has evolution, during evolution has led us to be able to do is a plank. And the plank is something I'm on the fence about, but I will explain it to you guys later. And that's um, where we support our body through our feet and through our forearms. So five movements. It doesn't matter what type of workout you do, you are going to involve one, two, three, four, five of those movements. And that's something to keep in mind. There are days that we can, you know, workouts that can be considered agonistic, antagonistic. We can do supersets, monster sets, negatives. Those, just so you know, regardless of what type or what word you want to use, I always tell my patients, my clients, my athletes, pick a goal. So today I'm only talking about strength. 
The difference between training power or endurance isn't the movement, it isn't the muscle group, and it certainly isn't the way you repeat those muscle groups in a week. It's simply by reps. So if you do reps of one, two, and three, you're naturally going to do power. If you do reps, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, you're gonna do strength. If you do anything over 10 reps, you're naturally going to do endurance. And so I always tell my clients, my patients, et cetera, et cetera, I need to know what your goals are because the easiest thing to manipulate is how many reps are you going to do? Once you can determine the reps, then you can determine the sets. And the sets is how many times am I gonna do these curls? How many times am I gonna do these squats? And you know, for what reason? So the average set range is usually three, and there's nothing wrong with that. You don't have to change that. The more reps and sets you do, again, the more endurance and, and aerobic you become. And I always say, so when you're doing strength, all you are trying to achieve is muscle fiber recruitment. There is a million ways to do that. And that's why things get confusing. So it's as long as you're pushing a muscle group to its limit and sometimes a little bit further, so you're creating fatigue, that will do the job. So I'm gonna go through some of them. Agonist, so A-G-O-N-I-S-T. Agonist means the same muscle group or the same movement. So if I was to do an agonistic workout, I'm going to choose the body groups that do the same thing, which is push or pull. So on a push day, I straighten my arms. So those are agonists. My chest and my triceps achieve the same thing. On an, a, on an antagonistic day, means that I'm going to choose two muscle groups that do the opposite. So I'm not doing push and pull. I'm going to do chest and biceps. So I'm gonna choose one muscle that pushes and one muscle that pulls. They are doing the opposite. So that would be an antagonistic day. And they're both perfectly good. There is no benefit to either one. There's no better research or science behind either one. It doesn't matter. What I tell everybody is, regardless of the philosophy that you choose, give it at least four weeks before you change it up because you'll have no idea if you're gaining any results before you switch it out. There's also negatives. So when I do a bicep curl, for example, I'm gonna curl this staple, stapler, okay. So when I do what's called a concentric contraction, meaning I am shortening the muscle. So a bicep curl shortens my bicep. This is concentric. But if I want to eccentrically load, and an eccentric workout is actually very effective for tendons, I am going to do this for the bicep. So I'm going to assist in the shortening, and I'm going to slowly, 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 slowly lengthen. And that would be considered an eccentric contraction. And what that does is every movement has a muscle that shortens and every movement has a muscle that allows it to lengthen. The lengthening process is the protective process. We see it a lot in sprinters. So when somebody is sprinting, it's all quad, it's all quad. But how many hundred meter dashes have you ever seen somebody grab the quad? They always grab the back of the leg and it's the hamstring that goes. And that is the eccentric contraction. So that's the muscle group that slows down the power group. And eccentrically, it's more rehab and it's definitely more protection of the tendon. So I, when I concentrically contract, I'm doing the muscle belly. But if I eccentrically contract, I'm doing the tendons. I'm not gonna get the muscle tone the strength or the bulk from an eccentric workout. 
But what I am going to get is I'm going to protect myself and make sure that I'm not out of balance. So I always add eccentric work to everything. Rotator cuff, legs, shoulders, everything. So something to keep in mind is to learn the word eccentrics and make sure you are adding that in. As athletes, most of our injuries come from tendons. And it's because we bulk the muscles and we don't strengthen the tendons to match. And if the bulk and the strength of the muscles exceed more than 60% of the strength of the tendons, you will always have tendon issues. I get it all the time. Oh, it's always my tendons. It's always my tendons. You're not born that way. You've created that imbalance and you've created that dysfunction. So uncreate it. So meaning don't be a dumbass and figure out how to create the strength and the tendons. But everybody just assumes that I'm just born this way, so I'm gonna keep bulking and bulking and bulking and forget the fact that that's only 50% of what occurs in a full muscle belly, like in a full muscle component. You've got the belly and the two tendons that attach it. You, you, you have to have some sort of a symbiotic relationship. They have to match, or at least as close to as we can. And that's where the eccentrics come in. The other thing we learn, we might hear is time under tension. And that's perfectly fine. What that means is, as long as the muscle spends enough time under tension, it's going to break down and it's going to recruit more muscle fibers. Perfect. So that could be eccentrics, that could be concentrics, that could be just slow movements, right? That could be a static hold. A lot of people will hold like in a farmer carry, hold the weight out here and walk. Those are all the same things. So time under tension philosophy can, can be applied right across the board. And it's accurate in itself as well. As long as the tissue has enough time where it's tensed and under tension, it will recruit. So again, you know, similar to a business philosophy, if if there's a demand, the, we will supply it. Supply and demand. The body is no different. So if the demand is, I need more muscle for a fibrous to, to handle this load, it's naturally going to build them. It doesn't have to tear in order to create muscle fiber recruitment. Most of our workouts and our philosophies around that is about damaging the tissue, forcing the body to produce more muscle fibers, and then thus getting builder bigger and bigger and bigger. That's one philosophy, yes. Time under tension is another one, and it doesn't require as much damage to the tissue. It just is, again, a supply and demand philosophy and has its own place. The other things you've probably heard of are supersets, monster sets. They're okay. I do, if my time is restricted, I will do supersets and monster sets. So for example, today I did shoulders and I only had 30 minutes. So I did three set, three different groups of exercises and I did three exercises each. So I did on a Smith bar, I did shoulder uh, military presses kind of things. Um, I did rear cable pulls and then I did a rotator cuff external rotation. And I did sets of 10. And I went boom, 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 rest, boom, 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 rest. So I did something that would be considered a monster set. And for me, that was because I was short on time. So my rest period only came after the third exercise. I wasn't resting in between each exercise, which then didn't eat up as much time. So those types of sets, um, I can't lift as heavy because I don't have as much rest but I'm still putting my muscles time under tension and I got in a workout in that I otherwise in any other type of philosophy could not have gotten in. I'm not, I don't do that often for me. Um, super sets are a little more common monster sets. Not so much. It's 100% based on my time restriction. If I have all the time in the world, I will lift. I will have a break. I will lift. I will have a break and my lifts are typically fairly heavy. So that's kind of like some of the philosophies, you know, so you guys understand. 
any one of them is 100% accurate, any one of them is 100% effective, and any one of them can be used at any given time. My suggestion is to give it four weeks, pick one philosophy, live by it for four weeks, take everything you can out of it. If you love it and you're getting, you know, you're getting changes, stick with it. If it did nothing for you, change it onto something else. Because you have to remember genetics play a really big role here. And you guys happen to be one, let's say population of athlete that I can get strength from, but I can't bulk. So long bodies, long muscles, long tendons, so less likely to bulk. But it doesn't mean you can't gain strength. But to find out what philosophy works best may take some playing with. So don't be afraid to mess around and figure out what you like, where you feel maybe the most sore, where you feel the biggest gains. Because just like medicine, where we practice medicine, this is not uh, you know, written in stone. This is a practice thing as well. We, even as a personal trainer or a strength and conditioning coach, things are figured out as we go and we learn our athletes and find out what things work and what things don't. So the next thing I want to go over is kind of how to put one of these together. Okay, Kim, so great. Now I know what eccentrics is. I'm going to go with time under tension. Great. Now what the hell do I do with that information? So what I want you guys to understand is you need to have a goal and it is incredibly important to have a goal. So Tyler Bertuzzi, strength and conditioning coach has come up. He's come up twice and he had a goal in mind. We didn't know what the goal was. So he can't ask the athlete what his weight is, body fat. It's, it's not in the off season. A professional athlete is in the off season. The coaching staff, the strength and conditioning staff, cannot ask for any of that information until training camp, just so you guys know. However, he still came up and gave us some direction on what he wanted Tyler to do. So the interesting thing was he had a goal, kind of shared it with us, gave us an idea of what goals he wanted Tyler to, to reach without asking Tyler if he's already there. So it's one thing for a strength and conditioning coach to have those goals. But what I found interesting was Tyler as the athlete couldn't possibly have the goals because he didn't know what the expectations were. So with that aside, it's incredibly important that you guys have your goals. Maybe it's to increase your vertical by an inch. Maybe it's to get a bigger chest. Maybe it's to be able to do bicep curls with bigger weight than your girlfriends or your boyfriends. Whatever the goal is, is irrelevant, it's personal and it's individualized. But make sure that when you're making one of these programs up, you know what it is. We always start with a warm up, and the warm up is usually cardio based. Years and years and years ago, our warm up would also involve stretching. We have taken that out for your age group, and we took it out because a lengthened muscle, which I've said before, is a weaker muscle. We don't want to weaken a muscle before the expectation of it is to strengthen or to shorten. So we do a cardio based warm up. It can be a dynamic warm up, which involves movements, whatever you like. And it's usually 10 to 20 minutes. We don't want to create fatigue and we don't want to use all of the energy systems up in your warm up because then we're not going to have them for the strength piece. So 10, 15, 20 minutes at most, you warm up, light sweat, a little bit of, of, of rosy cheeks, and then away you go. That's your warm up. Then we always, always stress that the first set and sometimes the first series of reps and sets are light. So you would take, let's say, five pound dumbbells if it's shoulder day, and you're going to rep sets of 12, 15, 20. And that's to get a generalized blood flow now to become a local blood flow. I need the blood flow here. I just walked on the treadmill, so I've got the blood flow in my legs. I have an increase in body temperature, but doesn't do me any good when I need the blood flow in my shoulders. So that first set of however many reps and sets you want to be as your warm up is literally just to focus the blood flow. I usually say if you like three sets of 10 reps, that's what your warm up is as well. You can wrap them up fast, that doesn't matter, 
Um, but you want to warm up whatever angles you're going to be using that day so that if it is shoulders, you need to be able to warm up full rotator cuff, all your bicep, your tricep, your um, deltoids, your traps. So you need to be able to do enough in those three sets of 10 reps in order to warm up the whole shoulder complex. You can't do that in five swings, right? So in order to take a large blood flow that you just created in your legs by being on the treadmill and to isolate that into smaller muscle groups in the upper body, you need to warm them up properly. So that would be the first set of sets, so to speak. Then you've got to figure out, okay, how many reps am I doing? What's my goal today? How many sets of those reps am I doing? And what is my rest time between everything? So if it's a power day, you're going to take more rest, less reps, so that you can recreate enough creatine in your system to be able to have that explosive power energy. If you're going to do endurance that day, you're going to build more lactic acid, which means you want higher reps, higher sets, and less rest in between, because you just wanna keep working through that burn as long as you can, because that's a little bit more of the time under tension philosophy. And if you're going after strength, you're somewhere in the middle. So you're gonna do three to four sets at the most, somewhere between eight and 10 reps, and you're gonna give yourself about a minute, two minutes rest. So something that allows the burn or discomfort to go away, and then you go back in it. And that's kind of how you figure it out. And if you're going to break it down to strength, endurance, and power, again, I tell you to wait until you've created enough of a change or benefit before you go into the next concept. So four to six weeks, four to six weeks, four to six weeks. Okay. Um, otherwise, if you do one week of strength and go to power, you're probably going to hurt yourself. You need the base there before you move on. And that way you can pretty much guarantee that it'll be a natural progression through those stages. And believe it or not, endurance is one of the toughest ones. The lactic acid and the burn in an endurance style workout actually is probably the most painful. The power is short and a little bit more rewarding. So a lot of people stay way too long in the power stage and don't progress through. As athletes, progress through. When we talked about the physiological profile of a basketball player, I explained that there's a, co a combination of aerobic and anaerobic. There's also a combination of endurance, strength, and power in basketball players. So you need to build all of them and you need to build them all equally and all efficiently. So make sure that you're giving yourself four to six weeks in all aspects. Okay. Then you got to figure out your rest days. And here is sometimes the toughest because it's going to obviously be the segue into the next part of this, but rest is really determined by what and what style. If you're doing power, you need longer rest days. You can only do power every 48 hours. So you may need two or three power days. So then you would do a push day, a pull day, a leg day. And in between that, you would give yourself a day or two rest. Um, and those ones are obviously faster. You get through it quicker and you have more time off. Um, endurance days, you can pretty much build endurance time under tension with one or two days off a week and that's it. And um, that's simply because you're not really tearing muscle fibers. The rest days are basically, you can focus on cardio or a, an active recovery, but you don't have to take time off or out of the gym entirely. A strength day rest um, is basically change your body. So you would do, um, you wouldn't do shoulders three times in a row. You would do a shoulder day, maybe a back day, a leg day. Well, those days are also considered rest days. Um, but if you have three days in a row that are all upper body, you're going to be using and sharing muscle groups. So you do need to throw a rest day in there so that you're getting a full upper body rest day. So a lot of people, if you want to build strength, will do a four day strength routine with three days off. 
Now, those three days off, though, can be active recovery days. So you can do cardio in there, um, and you can do abs, or you can take them entirely off. It's just that in order to repair fully, you need to give the day, you need to give the body that time off. And if your body is continually producing trauma, which is what creates some muscle fiber recruitment, then it's always stuck in an inflammatory cycle and it never shuts off. You need about 24 hours to complete that cycle. So if you had a really hard day or it was a bad workout, you know what, skip the next day, let that recover and go back to the next body type or body part, depending on what that is. So again, you want a well-grounded and a well-guided plan. Um, but again, pick your philosophy. In that philosophy, that has to be how you're going to divide your muscle groups, which I'm about to talk about, how you're going to figure out your rest days, your sets, your reps, um, and, and basically your warm-up, cool down, all those things. So now you've figured out your rest between your days. You've got your body parts figured out. Do not forget your cool down. In your cool down, you are allowing lactic acid to be removed, cortisol to be removed, you're realigning fibers. And if you need to stretch, which most people do, this is when you would do it. You would take a few minutes and just lightly and gently stretch out whatever body part you did. So it's a pretty big program and plan to put into place if you're gonna do this well. And you want your work, your warm up and your cool down to be about 10% of your overall work section, right? So expect that if you're gonna work for 40, 45 minutes to an hour, you need about six to eight minutes here and about six to eight minutes here. So you're looking at closer to an hour and a half and don't skip your warm up or your cool down because you will definitely feel it the next day. Lactic acid binds with oxygen. If you don't do a cool down and you go and sit, that lactic acid will pool and it will not have an ability until your next warm up day to have enough oxygenated blood to bind and remove from the body. It's a dumping mechanism like any other waste product in the body. You're better off to do it at the end of that workout, get it removed from the system, you'll be less sore, less stiff, and you'll be more prepared for the next day. So that's kind of how you create a program. Here's a few things about what days on what. Now, it's very common where um, some people will go chest and triceps, some people do chest and biceps. Um, you guys can figure out whatever you've got. Again, there is no wrong way to do this. Um, some people, if you want to increase muscle mass, decrease the days of cardio. Cardio, like we talked about with nutrition and energy earlier on in these sessions, if you don't have enough readily available energy, it's not fat we remove and use for energy, it's muscle. If you do too much cardio, you are going to burn muscle for fuel. So keep that in mind. You need to know your goals. If you want to burn fat, you may need to do one hour of cardio every single day. But if you want to put muscle on, be very careful because that counter counterbalances basically what your goals are. And um, me personally, I divide all my days up. So I do chest, I'll do arms, I do back, I do legs, um, I do shoulders, and I will usually do an ab day, but I also do cardio as often as I can. But I also have the base um, that I've created over the years, and so I, can, I like that format. I like to work my muscle groups hard. Um, I don't do agonists or antagonists. I like to choose my muscle groups and work them individually. Unless, like I said, I have a, um, uh, I'm pressed for time and then I'll do the monster set supersets. But other than that, I like my sets of 10. I will do three sets of 10. Um, I work my muscles to the point of fatigue um, where they are just about to give out because you know a lot of times we work out by ourselves and we don't have spotters. So you've got to get to know what your body's gonna do. You certainly don't wanna get hurt. And you know, those numbers work for me. Um, but you know, again, it's, it's kind of what works the best for you. A lot of people like to get two body parts done in one. It's very, very common. There's also people that will do it um, where they're doing three workouts a week because that's all they can get in. 
and the chest, shoulders, and tricep is a common one. Then you've got a rest day. Then you do back and biceps, a rest day, and then you'll do legs and core and a rest day. So if anybody, you know, needs help, if you can, you know, get a hold of me, um, let me know what days you can work out and that will then tell me which days are going to be rest days, what days are active days, what are days with Kyle. Like you wouldn't want to train hard maybe on Fridays when Kyle's going after all the skill development, but there's probably days in your week that you guys can train harder. And once you know what body parts require those versus the parts that can just be managed and, and, and kind of stabilized, then we can pick and choose. And there's a hundreds of thousands of workouts and exercises. You can Google bodybuilding.com. You can build, uh, you can Google muscle magazines and they will give you um, lots of options in terms of strength training. You can straight, you can Google uh, weights, machines, um, body weighted exercises. You can do um, bands, you can do kettlebells. So it all, you know, take a look at what you got at home. Take a look at what time you have, how many days a week, how many minutes each day, how many days you would like for cardio, your goals, write all that out on a piece of paper, take a look at it. And you can pretty much take that information and put it into a schedule. And that's how we usually teach everybody to do their own programs. And if anybody gets stuck, anybody gets stuck on a buzzword or a fad or just trying to figure out from Google what this means and, and how do I get this goal or understand what this means, email me kim at etrc.ca um, and, and ask those questions. I'd be happy to help you through some of the confusion of, of the weight training world. And understand there's certain parts of your body that are genetics calves are one of them and so you know don't overtrain calves because when they say you know they're what your mama gave you the calves come from your mom so you're you know you can do all the work you want in your calves and they're not going anywhere they're not going to change but the rest of the groups for the most part can and will change and you know as long as you know where you want to change your body for what purpose um, we can figure out your goals and the rest of the program from there. So that's basically strength training in a nutshell, everybody, minus the exercise physiology part. And uh, give me a call or email me if you have any questions. Everybody enjoy your night and uh, we'll see you next week. Bye.